I'm going to go over all of this step by step, but before I do that, I'll give a brief overview. To cope with this, you'll need to know the basics about momentum and kinetic energy. I will not be rehashing that. A collision is when two things bump into each other. You can have a collision with three things or more, but that tends to get complicated, so I won't cover that. So here we have mass one, mass two. They can be any kind of masses you like. Maybe they are molecules. These formulas do an excellent job of modeling what happens when two molecules floating through space bounce off of each other. Here we have the initial state just before the collision occurs. Here we have the final state just after the collision occurs. All collisions conserve momentum, there it is, and elastic collisions conserve kinetic energy, there it is. If you combine these two equations and do a bunch of algebra, you eventually get these two equations. And these two equations are what people will use most of the time to solve elastic collision problems. In a typical problem, you're given the values for mass one, mass two, V1 initial, V2 initial, and you substitute all of those things into here to find V1 final or V2 final. Now, elastic collisions have a special case and a general case. The general case is everything you see here in black and red. The special case is what you get when you erase all of the red stuff. Most textbooks only cover the special case. So most textbooks do not give you these full length versions of these formulas. They just give you the short versions. So if you're struggling with an elastic collision problem, it may well be that you've got the wrong formula. You've only got this, but you really need that. So starting from the top, here is our initial state just before the collision. Mass one is incoming with a velocity of V1 initial. It's about to impact mass two, which is stationary. Just after the collision, we have the final state. Mass two is moving off with a velocity of V2 final. And then mass one continues on with a velocity of V1 final. This velocity might be to the right or to the left, depending on circumstances. And we'll talk more about that later. If all of these velocity vectors are parallel to one another, we have a collision in one dimension. Typically in everyday life, a collision is not in one dimension. The masses will veer off in different directions and then you've got a collision in two dimensions or three. If that's the case, the math gets more complicated, but the principles are still the same. All collisions conserve momentum. Elastic collisions also conserve kinetic energy. In an inelastic collision, the final kinetic energy might be less or more than the initial kinetic energy. If you are given numbers for mass one, mass two, and V1 initial, then in principle, you should be able to calculate V1 final and V2 final. We have two equations with two unknowns, and in principle, you should be able to combine those two to solve for V1 final and V2 final. To actually solve these equations for V1 final and V2 final involves a whole page of algebra, which I'm going to skip. If anyone out there really wants to see it, leave a comment down below and I'll look into it. But if you do all that algebra, this is what you get. Now V1 final does not necessarily have to point to the right. If V1 initial is pointing to the right, then V2 final will certainly be pointing to the right. But this might bounce off of mass two and go back to the left. But these formulas have all been written with that in mind, particularly the momentum formulas. Notice how all of these quantities are positive. I've set this up in such a way that any vector pointing to the right is necessarily a positive quantity and any vector pointing to the left will be a negative quantity. So if V1 final turns out to be positive, the velocity will be to the right. 
and it's easy to see when that would be. If m1 is greater than m2, this quantity is positive and v1 final is positive. If m1 is less than m2, this will be negative, v1 final will be negative, and the velocity will be to the left. If m1 is equal to m2, this term is zero. Mass 1 stops dead, and then mass 2 sails off with exactly the same velocity that mass 1 had originally. And you can see that right here. If m1 equals m2, you've got a 2m in the top and a 2m in the bottom. v2 final equals v1 initial. As I said before, this is a special case. m2 does not have to be initially at rest. What if it's moving? Like this. If that's the case, we have to add some more terms to these equations here. Now you might wonder, how could a collision occur if mass 2 is actually moving away from mass 1? Well, if v1 initial is greater than v2 initial, m1 will catch up to m2 and there will be a collision. More typically though, you're going to have both of them coming toward each other. If mass 2 is initially moving to the left, then v2 initial will necessarily be negative, and if it happens to be pointing to the right, then it will be positive. So to derive formulas here is much more involved, but they work out to be. Notice that this term is exactly the same as this term if you just change all the ones to twos and twos to ones. Similarly, this term is exactly the same as that. Again, if you just reverse all the ones and twos. So these two equations are symmetric, which makes sense because these two equations are symmetric. If you just change all the ones to twos and vice versa here and here, you've got exactly the same thing. Now uh, let's take another look at that special case. There are actually three special cases of the special case that I would like to take a look at. Case one, mass one equals mass two. I mentioned this before. If m1 equals m2, v1 final is zero, and v2 final is just equal to v1 initial. This is what happens sometimes when uh, billiard balls bounce off of each other. Case two, mass one is much less than mass two. It's like uh, mass one's a ping pong ball and mass two is a bowling ball. What happens here? So v1 final is equal to negative v1 initial, v2 final is equal to zero. So mass two doesn't budge and mass one just bounces right off of mass two back the opposite direction at the same speed. If you don't believe me, use the formulas. Make up some numbers, plug them in, see what you get. I suggest you make mass one equal to one, mass two equal to a thousand, and v1 initial can be whatever you want. You get an answer very close to what I just said here. Try it again with mass two equal to a million, and the answer will be even closer to these. Now what if mass one is much greater than mass two? If the incoming mass is a bowling ball and it's impacting on a ping pong ball, I'm pretty sure the bowling ball is not gonna slow down very much at all. V1 final equals V1 initial. So what happens to mass two? Well, it actually goes shooting off at double the initial speed of mass one. And again, the formulas will help you see that. If M1 is a thousand and M2 is one, Again, V1 initial can be whatever you want. You can confirm both of these and you get a more exact confirmation if you just change M1 to a million. Thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe. If you're interested in being tutored online by me personally, I am available until further notice. You can find out more at my website, alternateprof.com.